How's everybody doing? All right. Well, welcome to the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Museum tonight. This is a special night. This is a night that I've been waiting for for a long time. It means that our new exhibit, The Rivalry, the Cubs versus Cardinals, is up and running. And uh, it's going so well, uh, the folks who helped us create this exhibit decided to show up tonight and talk about the process. That's right. That means success. And so, uh, again, I'm just so happy uh, to see the response thus far uh, to our exhibit. We're starting to uh, see uh, new faces that are coming in in cardinal outfits, cub outfits, to see this exhibit. Anytime I see them, I try to go up to them and I say, have you been to our museum before? And some folks tell me they haven't. It was this exhibit that brought them out. I'm so excited when I, when I hear that because they come for the Cardinals and the Cubs and believe me, they stay to learn more about Abraham Lincoln and the American Civil War. That's a uh, absolutely wonderful uh, thing for our museum here. So tonight, we have a couple missions, but I wanna start out by talking about how this came to be. How did the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Museum come to host an exhibit on uh, the more than century long rivalry between the St. Louis Cardinals and the Chicago Cubs. If you're a staff member uh, of the ALPLM, can you raise your hand? I could kind of see the crowd right now. I got a couple hands right now. The, uh, this process started more than two years ago. Our exhibit committee internally made up of folks from different departments throughout the museum and the library. We came together and we thought, how can we uh, uh, use the Illinois Gallery in our museum most effectively? What's the mission of our Illinois Gallery? In fact, when Bob Rogers was here, I asked him that question. And uh, he uh, told me to look up right above the Illinois Gallery. And he said, what's that say? And I said, Illinois Gallery. And he said, well, that's where you're supposed to tell Illinois stories. <laughs> That made a lot of sense to me. And so we decided to work as a group of uh, uh, museum professionals, and we brainstormed what are ideas, what are uh, topics that folks would like to see, Illinois stories that weren't necessarily uh, related overtly to Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War. During those series of meetings, we compiled a list of 125 different ideas. We uh, soon trim that list down, and we had our top five ideas. And one of those ideas was baseball. We knew we wanted to do something with baseball, but that's a huge topic. How do we trim it down? And somebody on one side of the table said, well, as long as you make it about the Cubs, I'll help you. <laughs> Pretty soon, somebody on the other side of the table said, no, 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 the Cardinals. And so some light bulbs went off. And we thought, Cardinal-Cub rivalry, my goodness, that's the that's a, uh, a pretty good genesis of an exhibit. As we got excited about that, I uh, began to get a little bit nervous. The Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library, we have a phenomenal collection uh, made up of world-class objects, documents related to uh, the life and times of Abraham Lincoln, all sorts of aspects of uh, Illinois history. But to be honest with you, my archive of game used memorabilia from Chicago Cub and St. Louis Cardinal games, it's uh, very light. And so I needed to uh, make some uh, good partnerships out there. And as a team, we talked about who would the great partners be. It doesn't get any better than the two teams themselves, the St. Louis Cardinals and the Chicago Cubs. And I used the greatest tool that any historian has out there, Google. <laughs> I googled the St. Louis Cardinals Hall of Fame Museum and that's where uh, I met a wonderful person named Paula Holman and that's who I want to introduce you uh, to tonight. She is the uh, curator of the St. Louis Cardinals Hall of Fame Museum. Paula, do you remember that first phone call? I do. <laughs> uh, and, <clears throat> you know, I, I remember uh, your interest, your proposal uh, to do that. And I thought, what a great idea, because we know how dynamic the rivalry is between the Cubs and the Cardinals. 
And, you know, I'm really lucky. I've got this great museum. I've been there since 1993. And uh, we have been continuing to build the collection over all the years that I've been there. And we had a pretty darn good collection when I got there in the first place. So, so we really have a rich collection of things. And uh, we certainly can't show everything in the 8,000 square foot museum that we uh, just opened again in 2014. And <clears throat> if you haven't had a chance, do come down and take a look at it. But it was a great opportunity to share some of this great baseball legacy that we have that by necessity, we, we can't fit everything in, into our museum space. All museums have that situation. We can never have a museum big enough to fit everything that we've collected if we have a robust collection. And so to me, the idea of working with a presidential library and museum, I was like, that's pretty awesome. I'm excited about this concept. And um, the other thing that I knew is that I've got a pretty small staff. Um, I've got, I'm very fortunate to have uh, two ladies that work with me. But we keep pretty busy uh, with our little museum. And I said, look, I know that I can support this concept and this exhibit by providing you with loan materials. But I'm not sure that I can really help you dig into the details of, of how that story is going to knit together. And I think he uh, went out and found somebody else that was going to help him with that part. That's right. Uh Paula, the, the very first thing I remember telling you on the phone is I said, I have this crazy idea. And I said, well, I'm all ears. And I said, you know, you could work with the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Museum on an exhibit about uh, the history of the St. Louis Cardinal and Chicago Cub rivalry. And you told me, Sam, that is not a crazy idea at all. That gave me a lot of confidence. And so I appreciate that very much. Um, the content expertise was something that we really uh, needed. As Paula said, she's got a fabulous uh, collection there. Have y'all been to the St. Louis Cardinal Hall of Fame Museum? Yeah. An absolutely beautiful facility. I got to, to tour uh, with Paula and her team. It was uh, fabulous, some great, great works being done there. Um, so I knew that they had a fabulous collection, but I knew um, that we really needed a, a content expert to work with us to develop the storyline. Uh, the historians we have here, great historians, um, but we're experts in, you know, the American Civil War, and the life and times of Abraham Lincoln, and those uh, sorts of things. Various aspects of Illinois history, but I really needed somebody that knew the ins and outs of this rivalry dating back to the 19th century. That's a tall order for me uh, to, to try to fill on this exhibit. And Paula put me in touch with uh, the National Baseball Hall of Fame. I thought, that's a good start, <laughs> sending me to the National Baseball Hall of Fame. And I got on the phone with a senior curator there um, named Tom Schieber. He's uh, the next person uh, we'll hear from. Uh, Tom, you want to tell us a little bit about your background? Where are you from? <laughs> I'm from St. Louis. <laughs> <coughs> what are the odds of that? <laughs> I was born and raised in St. Louis. Uh, and um, my background has very little to do with museum studies. Uh, so I was working in a very different field for a long time. Um, but I've always been interested in baseball history since I was a little kid. And I just didn't think there really was anybody who would pay you to work in baseball history. And there really aren't very many people that will pay you to work in baseball <laughs> history. Um, don't let that stop your dreams. But, um, uh, but I lucked out and uh, um, was able to work, uh, get a job with the Baseball Hall of Fame and eventually work my way up to senior curator. So where were you working before you got into baseball? You really want me to talk about this? Um, yes. So my background is in astrophysics. So I work in, <laughs> and usually when people hear that, they go, gosh, what's the connection between astrophysics and um, being a museum curator? And I say, there is no connection. <laughs> um, so I, I did that for a dozen years. Um, but uh, it actually afforded me a lot of free time. Um, believe it or not, is to um, do a lot of baseball research, which was my love. And uh, I really enjoyed the, the uh, astronomy part, actually, as well. 
Um, the best part about it was that I worked in solar physics, which means that I studied the sun, which means that at nighttime I could go down and watch ball games. I was living in <laughs> Los Angeles at the time. So um, the nighttime astronomy thing would not have worked for me. <laughs> Uh, you got in sort of on the ground floor of sabermetrics, right? Well, I, yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I've been a Saber member since the early 1980s, so um, for quite a while now. And, but I've never been a big numbers guy, mm -hmm. um, even though I got into astrophysics. But uh, um, I've not really been a numbers guy, but definitely a baseball history guy. And Saber really encompasses, there's a lot of numbers people in that, but it's really about um, baseball history, Society for American Baseball Research, so it's not just numbers. But. It's, uh, I was talking to Tom early on, these were the sort of the genesis of the, the first conversations that we had as a team, getting to know one another. Um, and he told me about his background and I was completely fascinated. Uh, somebody that's into astrophysics comes into uh, the baseball world and it reminded me of um, being a kid. And where I really, I think as I look back, where I started to learn how uh, division worked was baseball. If I went three for four, what was my batting average? <laughs> 750, right? I knew all those uh, statistics, and Tom told me about a much more sophisticated way of uh, baseball statistics, the sabermetrics uh, movement uh, that he get, got in on the ground floor. But as we began to develop this exhibit, working with our fantastic education team, Genevieve Kaplan, et cetera, you could think of all the really cool STEM programs we could run uh, using baseball as that backdrop. Um, lots of cool possibilities uh, started to emerge. Uh, so that's been a, a really interesting aspect of this from an education standpoint. So we've got the Cardinals great collection and their expertise. We had a content expert, although Tom's from St. Louis, he told me that he had grown up loving watching games at Wrigley Field every chance that he got the opportunity. He was deeply immersed uh, in the rivalry and could uh, talk baseball history with us all the way back to the 19th century. But what I really needed was uh, somebody from the Chicago Cubs as well. And I'm so happy that I got to meet Lydia Walkie. Lydia, uh, why don't you tell us? <laughs> Lydia's been uh, fantastic. We got to hang out a lot at the Cubs convention. We got to see 10,000 Cub fans uh, straight from the World Series victory, excited about what uh, this year has to uh, uh, entail. But well, Lydia was a great addition, and Lydia, can you tell us a little bit about what your job is with the Chicago Cubs? Because sure. it's pretty cool. Well, let's set the stage here. Yeah. Cardinals fan, Cardinals fan, Cardinals fan. <laughs> so I just want credit for being willing to take the stage surrounded by a sea of red and drive, you know, three and a half hours to do it. Yes. Uh, and I hope we have some folks uh, here who uh, bleed cubby blue because uh, otherwise I'm a little outnumbered. Uh, I am not the Cubs historian. I am not the Cubs archivist. I'm the Cubs lawyer. Uh, I've been with the Cubs for seven years and when I started with the Cubs, I think I was the third new hire by the Ricketts family uh, after they took control of the team. And very early on, uh, the question was raised, where's our stuff? And we all kind of looked around and said, yeah, well, where's our stuff? And, and by stuff, everybody knew what we all meant. You know, where's our Hall of Fame? Where's our museum? Where's, you know, the Cardinals have this really great museum. And, and a lot of other teams do too. Where's our stuff? You know, we, we are, playing baseball in the only surviving Federal League ballpark. It's the second oldest Major League ballpark. It's a living museum. You know, we, were, we founded the National League in 1876. We've been playing since 1870. We have an amazing history. Where is it? And the answer was, it, it didn't seem to be as much of a priority to the previous owners, and so, the Ricketts family uh, kind of cast about and said, well, we need to put a program together. Who wants to do this? And uh, I didn't raise my hand. I was selected. <laughs> uh, and, and I think uh, they were looking for someone with a little bit of tenacity, a little bit of appreciation for the history of a baseball team being part of our intellectual property, 
Uh, I also have a really good eye for dating photos based on the uniform and the logo that the player is wearing, intellectual property attorney. <laughs> And, uh, and we just kind of started looking in every nook and cranny to see what do we have. Uh, we did find some things. We found some of our pennant certificates uh, from the 30s and uh, 1945. The, the 30s Cubs went to the World Series every three years. Uh, and uh, we found a treasure trove, really, as we cleaned out storerooms. But we didn't have you know, a place to put them and a place to display them. And you know, I'm proud to say as we are uh, renovating Wrigley Field, we're starting to find those areas, but uh, we're certainly you know, three decades behind Paula's program. But uh, we were really excited to get the call. Uh, I was really excited as an attorney, because if you're an attorney working in Illinois, uh, Lincoln is obviously your favorite president. Uh, you know, you, you'd probably have your bar card taken away from me if you didn't say that. <laughs> but uh, more than that, the chance to bring a little bit of Wrigley Field and of the Chicago Cubs to downstate Illinois, I think, is something that really means a lot to all of us. Uh, it was very important to us when we finally did have a trophy to display uh, to, to get that trophy out to Iowa, to get it to Illinois, to get it to some of the areas where we had people making the trek up to Wrigley Field, uh, but they don't necessarily have the time or the resources to do it very often. And so it meant a lot to us to have the, uh, the Lincoln Museum reach out to us and include us in this, and we're, we're really grateful to be a part of it. Well, how many of you folks uh, came to get your picture with the uh, Chicago Cub Trophy? Yeah. That day was, that was an awesome day. And uh, Lydia says, I'm a Cardinal fan, right? But I'm a, a fan of baseball. And it was, it was an awesome day here at the museum. It was so exciting. It was cold outside, yet people lined up around the block. Uh, and people were, were so excited. I don't think I, I think I saw, every person I saw that day was smiling. And that's, uh, that's really neat um, um, to see. So we were uh, blessed to be part of that day as well. Mm -hmm. So as I'm thinking, you know, I remember a lot of our early discussions here from a museum a staff a standpoint when we began to think, what do we uh, want in this exhibit? What do we uh, want it to be? When you guys got the call, you're excited maybe to work with a presidential library and a museum. You're excited about the uh, opportunity. But I know you had to have uh, some things. What did you want this exhibit to be? What were things you wanted to see in this exhibit? Um, can you guys talk about some of those things? I know I can share some of my viewpoints, no, but maybe it's important to hear yours first. I had an agenda that I pushed with Tom, which was, I need you to do something with Margaret Donahue. And, oh, I uh, love that. Yeah. Uh, I, I have a personal connection to the Margaret Donahue family in that I've, I've met them and spent time with them, and we recently uh, named a local park after Margaret Donahue uh, right in the vicinity of Wrigley Field that we funded there was a, a neighborhood in Wrigleyville that just needed a park. And uh, the Chicago Park District has a history of naming parks after women. And we immediately said, we have the perfect person. We have the first female executive in baseball outside of team ownership. Uh, her name's Margaret Donahue. She started as a secretary uh, in uh, 1919, I believe. And uh, Bill Vex Sr., our then team president, hired her, and she slowly worked her way up the ladder to corporate secretary and vice president, and uh, was there until she retired. She uh, received a gold pass from Major League Baseball. She was the architect of the Cubs season ticket program, uh, as, it, as it exists today, really. Uh, she was also a nationally renowned expert on uh, Major League rules. And uh, you did not move a player if you worked for the Cubs without talking to Miss Margaret. So she was a, a really important part of our history, and I thought that was a story that needed to be told. I thought it was a really lovely way that you covered it alongside the Cardinals. Yeah, it was well, great. It, was, it, it worked out really well because um, if you're talking about uh, female executives in baseball history, which there's not a lot, but especially for the, let's say the prior to to World War II, um, there really are two that stand out, and one is Margaret, and the other is from, 
is the executive who owned the Cardinals for a while, uh, Helen, Helen, Helene. Helene, 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 Helene Britton. Britton, who was uh, the, the niece of the, uh, the former <coughs> owner. Yeah, the, the two brothers, the Robeson brothers, Frank and Stanley, purchased uh, the Cardinals team in 1898. Um, <coughs> and she was the daughter of Frank. Frank died in, I think, 1909. Don't quote me. Um, but Frank passed away in 1911. And she inherited the team from her uncle, from Stanley, I'm right, sorry, from Stanley. Stanley. And <clears throat> we have right now in our temporary gallery women in baseball, and we highlight some important stories for women with our franchise, Helene being a really important one. And it was amazing to me that uh, after the holidays, uh, Chris Britton, who is a descendant of Helene, came with his family, and I don't know what was. January or February or something, mm -hmm. and he brought a purple, you know, folder like you might have your school paper in, and he says, I, I brought some stuff, I thought you might be interested in looking at it, and when he opened it up, there were some lovely, lovely pictures of Helene um, that we had not seen before, but then he like turns this other piece of paper, and there is this document, and it is... Stanley Robeson's last will and testament written out on three pages on Cardinal stationery, leaving the club to Helene. And I was just like, oh my gosh. I was just like, oh. You know, and um, because our exhibit was already up, I said, uh, Chris, you know, we would love to be able to scan these things. And you know maybe we can you know in, somehow include him in the case, but I really think I want to talk to our friends in Springfield and Tom about this document. And I sent an email out, and boy, <laughs> <laughs> got responses firing back, going like, "What? Yeah, we want that." Yeah. So it is on display in the exhibit, and it's fantastic. Things like that happen, um, and I always call it the magic, the magic of an exhibit. Sort of this is all fresh in our minds, and uh, a piece like that just walks in, the perfect uh, piece to an uh, important piece of, uh, of the exhibit that we're working on. It's, it's magic. That's the only way to describe it. Tom, you come with an interesting perspective in this as a baseball uh, historian. When you're thinking about this exhibit, what were elements that were really important to you to showcase in, in an exhibit like this? Um, well, can I talk about a particular artifact? Please do. So, so Lydia was talking about making sure we talk about Margaret Donahue, and, and thanks to you, Lydia, for being able to pull off getting some great items to tell that story, because that's not a particularly easy, straightforward way. Um, it's not easy to think of an artifact that's going to tell an executive story as, as it is maybe a first baseman story or a pitcher story. Sometimes it's a little bit more obvious what those artifacts might be. But um, uh, Liddy did a great job. Um, the artifact that first came to my mind when I thought about this Cards Cubs exhibit, which I got very excited about the minute you had me at hello, Sam, um, <laughs> was um, an object that's kind of a, got a wacky story. And the Cardinals was, uh, Museum was displaying it. And that is a trophy known as the Wyman Trophy, which is a trophy that's in the exhibit um, that was owned by the White Sox. And um, it is a beautiful trophy that was made in uh, 1886. It was first awarded in 1886. So I'll give you a bit, little background about this, this trophy. Um, the idea was the trophy would be awarded to whoever won the pennant in the American Association, which was at that time a rival to the National League. Um, has nothing to do with the modern minor league American Association. And um, so whoever won the pennant would get the trophy, and then whoever won the pennant the next year, it, the trophy would be handed over. It's not a new trophy each time. Um, it, it, would, it would transfer. And there was a tradition at the time um, in sports in general, not, not baseball trophies, that if you won a championship trophy three years in a row, so you're giving it back to yourself each time, the, the trophy would be retired. And as it turns out, this trophy never left the Browns. The Browns won it in 1886, and then 87, and then 88, and they got to keep it. Um, 
And the owner of the Browns, a guy named Chris Van Dra, uh, who's a beer baron in St. Louis, um, he uh, kept that trophy for a long time. And then when he passed away, he willed it to a favorite ball player of his, who was a close associate of his, a guy named Charlie Comiskey, who was their, the, the first baseman for the Browns. Wait, you're already ahead of the story here. Hold on. <laughs> and um, Car Charlie Comiskey um, was no longer with the Browns. He had moved over um, and eventually actually became owner of the Chicago White Sox of the American League, which took their name in 1901. They decided to use a retro name. They took the name Chicago White Stockings and shortened it because the Chicago White Stockings then nationally became the Chicago Cubs. You might be good to take notes here. And, uh, and so that's how this trophy that really is a, and the Browns, by the way, became the Cardinals. Yes. So a Cardinals trophy originally won by the Browns that went into the hands of the White Sox. But all of that mess, it's an absolutely gorgeous trophy. It's probably my favorite um, baseball trophy around. It's fantastic. And if you haven't seen the exhibit, obviously you're going to want to see the exhibit. Um, it's, it's a real stunner. It's when you first walk in, essentially, and the first case is there. And I just knew that that had such a great Chicago-St. Louis connection. And there's not a whole lot of artifacts in the exhibit that are directly related to both cities. That's very hard to pull off. But this was one, <laughs> and I immediately thought this would be fantastic. So I crossed my fingers and I asked Paula about it, <laughs> and it worked out. Well, and the thing is, we had it on loan uh, from the White Sox. Uh, our ownership was really interested and really wanted, when we opened our museum in 2014 in Ballpark Village, they were like, would you please see if the White Sox would let us have that? That would be so great for our early history case. And so we, we did get it. We worked with uh, Jeff Sisnell, who is uh, with the White, White Sox. And <clears throat> so when we, we talked to him about this, and uh, he, was, he was very excited also to uh, have it here in Springfield. Um, he says he wants it to go back up there um, because it was really only on loan to us. But he does say that if we want it back again, we can get it another time. So we'll, we'll probably ask him about that again later. It's <laughs> great. It's, it's, a, a, it's an amazingly wonderful trophy. That's yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Well, I know uh, along the way as this exhibit was uh, taking shape, I kept promising uh, crowds that uh, the objects you see in this exhibit, your jaw will hit the floor. And one of those pieces that really did it for me, um, Lydia, Tom, if you could talk about that, uh, that lease uh, from oh. the land. Uh, talk to the lawyer Wrigley about the Fields. lease. <laughs> I love leases. That's a, I it's an amazing piece. I could not Only believe that a lawyer that still could love leases. That, and that came in really near the end of the whole thing. That was yep. a yeah. fairly last second uh, yeah. addition. Yeah, we, uh, we actually have the Wrigley Company to thank for that. Uh, I don't know uh, how many people know the history of the ownership of the club from a corporate perspective. The Wrigley Company never owned the Chicago Cubs, uh, but the um, chairman and the, the Wrigley family owned the Cubs. William Wrigley Jr. Uh, owned the Cubs from, oh gosh, 1919 on until his death. And then his son, Philip Knight Wrigley, uh, took control of the Cubs. And, uh, and it wasn't until after his death that the Cubs were sold to the next ownership. Uh, so for a long time, the corporate offices of the Chicago Cubs were in the Wrigley Building in downtown Chicago on Michigan Avenue. And a few years ago, the Wrigley Company moved out of the Wrigley Building. And so they placed a call one day to our head of media relations, just the first person they got a hold of, and, and Peter sent them on to me, and the phone call went something like this. Yeah, we're cleaning out some storage rooms, and we have like five boxes of Cub stuff. Do you want it? Do you want us to eBay it? And I said, I'll be there in 15 minutes. <laughs> and it's one of those, it's a 20 minute drive, I'll be there in 15. <laughs> and, uh, and it was a, a really lovely preserved collection uh, from the Wrigley Company Art Department, which uh, served both the Wrigley Company and the Chicago Cubs. And the head of their art department, or one of the heads, was a gentleman by the name of Otis Shepard, who designed a lot of our program covers, a lot of our artwork. Uh, his wife did a lot of work with him, probably as an unsung uh, contributor to his work. And uh, 
In addition to that, there were original photographs, there were um, corporate minute books, our board books going back actually to 1914 to the Federal League Baseball Club, which uh, eventually merged with Chicago National League Ball Club when the Cubs moved to Wrigley Field in uh, 1916. And so it was, a, it was really kind of a nice little treasure trove. And then there was this just little unassuming manila folder at the bottom of it, and I reached in, pulled it out, and, and it's, a, it's a very unassuming document that says 99-year lease on the cover. And I knew the second that I saw it what it was because I'm the lawyer, and I had read the land records and, and seen uh, the, the history of Wrigley Field and land records, and this lease is referenced a number of times. And, uh, and it was, there it was, right there. And there's a lovely little slip of paper on top of it that we've preserved with the lease uh, that is uh, essentially William Wrigley Jr. Uh, merging the lease with the fee interest. And so, uh, no, it didn't expire. <laughs> we didn't lose the lease on Wrigley Field. When we got it, it was actually uh, 2012 or 2013. And I had a lot of people saying to me, <gasps> Is it expiring? Do we need to worry? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it, it was just a lovely piece of you know Wrigley Field history that it was it was just incredibly generous of the Wrigley Company to you know call us as opposed to saying well they they don't they didn't you know they didn't raise a stink so we'll just do whatever we want with it. So as we were designing this exhibit, it was so important to us, uh, and you can hear by some of the conversations so far that. We understood that this baseball rivalry was even about more than just the players on the field. Um, there are the executives that play such a role. There are um, the, uh, the ballparks themselves become iconic uh, uh, living museums, uh, as Lydia said earlier. Um, it was important for me, too, to tell the stories of the broadcasters, the greatest uh, broadcaster of all time in my life, of course was Harry Carey and Jack Buck and Mike Shannon and all those guys um, that you know I grew up uh, uh, listening to. Harry Carey, in all honesty, he was um, the voice of the Cubs for me as a young guy. I remember running home from school. Uh, we lived a block away uh, from school when I was growing up. But my brother and I, we raced home so we could listen to the last couple innings of a Cardinal game. We could hear Harry um, if he was having a good day or not. <laughs> and uh, that was always a lot of fun. Um, but then that night you'd fall asleep listening to uh, Jack Buck or uh, Mike Shannon on the radio. And that was always uh, uh, fantastic. So those guys, they make their appearance uh, in this exhibit. But I want to tell you what was so important to me uh, in this exhibit. And that was you guys. This wouldn't be uh, worth doing um, it wouldn't be a rivalry worth uh, remembering um, if it weren't for the fans for more than a century who have cared so deeply um, about this rivalry. You know, we study um, the crisis of the 1850s and how Abraham Lincoln proclaimed uh, this country a house divided. Well, guess what? I grew up in central Illinois. <laughs> it's a house divided when it comes to our baseball loyalties. I have met so many beautiful families that are uh, blended families made up of Cardinal fans and Cub fans. And uh, that to me is what is, is so cool uh, in this exhibit. I've gotten to meet so many of you. So in this exhibit, we tried to, to highlight that in many different ways. And Tom was great um, in trying to help us sort out those ideas. So when you go through the exhibit, you can play trivia. You can play trivia as a Cardinal fan or a Cub fan. And if you notice, we keep track of how many answers the Cardinal fans get right, how many answers the Cub fans get right. You know who's winning? The Cubs. The Cubs are dominating that game. <coughs> Where are you, Cardinal fans? The season's early. <laughs> the season's very early. That's right, it's very early. That's a very good point. Uh, there's all kinds of photo ops. I was telling these guys earlier that uh, it, it's so cool to get your picture you know, taken next to Fred Bird if you're a little kid. I've seen so many. Uh, my niece sent me a beautiful picture uh, the other day. She did that. And then you, know, you can get your picture uh, celebrating with Anthony Rizzo and the guys uh, for the 
2016 World Series, I've seen so many moms trying to get a perfect action shot when their uh, little kid jumps up in the air uh, on that spot, which is really cool. But Tom, you kind of helped us out with um, one of my favorite parts uh, in the exhibit. That's the post-it note idea. I'm a, I'm a big believer in this. And I do not have, I should invest in the post-it company. It's 3M probably. Sure. Right there, because I push it wherever I go. Uh, it was probably about five or six years ago uh, I was doing a different project, um, and I was in Washington, D.C., and touring through the museum. I don't know if everyone's been to the museum in D.C., but it's a fantastic ex uh, museum. And uh, some people I was talking with said, oh, you've got to see this great, I great exhibit where people, um, it's, it's a timeline, of, it's, it has, it's a museum thing, so it had to do with uh, how news stories were covered in magazines, in popular magazines. And they did a timeline, and off of the timeline were various artifacts. They were usually magazine covers. But also, on the timeline, you could, there's space to fill out a post-it. You could write your, you know, some, something, and post it in the right spot on a timeline. Like, oh, this is, you know, so you've got a magazine coverage of the Kennedy, assass Kennedy assassination, and then, but you could put a post-it and say, you know, I was there, I remember this or that, whatever. And when I first heard about it, I was like, this is not going to work. It's going to be lots of people are going to post things off topic, or it's going to be a disaster. They're all the, these sideways, and it's, it's going to look terrible. And I saw it, and I was floored by how, how it really did incorporate the visitor into the, the exhibit. And that's something I constantly strive for, is how can I get the visitor to have um, not just, it's not a one-way one, one -way dialogue where we're just talking to you about the Cardinals, the Cubs, the rivalry, but to have the visitor be part of the exhibit. And that was a great way to do it. It's super low tech, it never breaks, you don't have to use any electricity, um, and it, it works out great. And so I push it wherever I go, and I was uh, um, very much wanting to do that here. And um, but every time I walk through the, the exhibit, the wall is packed full of post-its, and you go up to them, and you know you get a couple off-topic ones. That's fine. You, of course, you can get that. But the vast majority hit home at exactly what we asked, which was you know share your baseball memory about Cardinals Cubs rivalry, and and you get everything from whether, whether it's a you you told a great story, but, but uh, which I'll let you do in a second. But you know it's, you know whether it's someone saying I um, I remember my dad taking my me to my first Cardinal game, or I, I remember seeing uh, uh, Sean Dunstan uh, turn a great double play, whatever the case may be. So, and you were mentioning one that, where there's not even any writing. Yeah, you know, <sighs> how many uh, museum volunteers do we have in the crowd tonight? God love you. <laughs> Give them a brown. Um, and the rest of you, why aren't you volunteering? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. I, I asked that question because these guys help us. Uh, they go through and they make sure that the uh, the post-it notes are on topic, and the uh, one or two uh, uh, people who put one off topic, we, uh, we take that down. But um, some of those post-it notes have brought me to tears, telling really personal stories about uh, a real moment in their life that happened with maybe their parents or a little leaguer, man, when they got that double that drove in the winning run or something. And I've been blown away. I never expected this in a million years. But even little kids who can't even write yet, they draw little pictures. They draw a picture of themselves playing baseball or uh, you know, something that they can connect to it. So that, even though that was completely unexpected, um, that's been absolutely beautiful. It just reaffirms baseball is this game. Uh, some of us are just born into it, right? Um, Mom and dad are uh, Cardinal Cub fans, and uh, they, watch them, they watch the games all the time. In the backyard, they're playing wiffle ball. And uh, before they could even write, uh, they're drawing pictures of themselves playing the game. Pretty cool. I wanted to make a comment about that, too, because <clears throat> you know, it's, it's really important for me in the exhibits that we put up that, that we really do want to tap into your memories that are personal to you. And I always thought with the baseball museum that, that I oversee that, that it seemed generational, that grandfathers could, could come in and they would want to look at the stuff we have about Stan Musial and Red Shandeast or Enos Slaughter or, or Ducky Medwick and, and, and that generation. And, and then dads might be you know, with them and, and they want to know about Lou Brock or Bob Gibson or 
Bob Forrish or <clears throat> any of those 60s, 70s guys that are um, you know, so nameable, or even the 80s. But, but it ends up being really generational to, to who did you grow up with? Because those are the players that I think end up really having the strongest uh, in, personal connection. Mm -hmm. And then when you can go and you can see something that ties into that, it, it is bringing that into, into you personally. And your, your memory and your heart are engaged. And that's, for me, the most successful thing that we can do as museum people is to really tap into your own heart with what we're able to show you and tell you in the stories that, that we can illustrate with what we have to work with. So well yeah. said. Well, I don't want to monopolize all the time up here by asking these folks uh, these questions. Does anybody in the audience have a question uh, for us to respond to? Yes, sir. The question is, he wants to know where Tom Sheber went That's to high school. That's such a St. Louis question. Yeah. Uh, I went to John Burroughs School in, uh, just outside of St. Louis. Where did you go? Oh, there you go. Is that really like a big St. Louis question? You know, I it actually is. never realized that until maybe 10 years ago. There was a, someone wrote a whole article about how that's the default St. Louis question. I had missed this growing up, uh, but uh, apparently that's What's a, the default Chicago it, question? No, we ask that a lot in Chicago. Yeah, well, see. Okay. What neighborhood yeah, uh, do you live in? Where'd you grow up? Yeah. What high school? See, we have common okay. vibes. Yeah. <laughs> Midwest. Yeah, in the back, blue shirt. Yeah. Yeah, so actually that's a really critical question that, that um, I asked myself when we were first trying to come up with the concept for the exhibit. All we had was Cardinals-Cubs rivalry, at, which is a great start, but you need to have a real um, understanding about what you're going to talk about, what you're not going to talk about. And I got to thinking a lot about what makes for an epic rivalry. And there's a number of factors, and I totally agree with you that the, there's three main rivalries in, in baseball, the ones that you had mentioned. Um, so let's take a look at the commonality. Let's look at what's similar about those three rivalries. And they all have, each club has a rich history in and of itself, independent of the other club. Um, there were formative times between those clubs where they were both very competitive on the field at the same time. And both clubs come from rival cities that are generally, there's a proximity situation. So obviously Dodgers Giants starts in, uh, in Brooklyn and New York. Red Sox Yankees have a New York Boston rivalry and St. Louis Chicago has a proximity, especially from a Midwest standpoint, the two, two major cities. Um, and that's, if you were to, um, that's the, your recipe for an epic rivalry is those three things, proximity, history, and competition in the field. One thing that I think a lot of people um, make a mistake about regarding the Cardinals-Cubs rivalry for those three elements is the last one I mentioned, which is competition on the field at, the, at a high level. Because a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, the Cubs, you know, they, they've had this long struggle, and so where was the competition? And, and hopefully if you see the exhibit, you realize that that's not true. The Cubs have been a very good team many times, and especially, I personally feel that the period of the late 20s and throughout the 30s, you know, uh, Lydia mentioned every three years, the, the Cubs went to the World Series, 29, 32, 35, 38. 
But at that same time, the Cardinals were great. They went to World Series in 26, 28, 30. One, 30, 31, 30, 31 34. 34. So these are two teams that are completely dominating the National League, playing against one another. That's a long stretch of time at that high level. I, it's, in my book, that's where it really solidified. There was lots of rivalry before that, but there's no turning back after Roger the 20s Swansby. and 30s. Yeah, yeah Roger Swansby actually wearing both colors. So um, uh, that's what makes for a great rivalry. And that, I had to write that down, and I kept on thinking about that as I was putting together the exhibit with the rest of the crew here was, um, are the stories that I'm telling hitting home at those three elements? If not, you know, it might be a cool story, but I don't have time to go off on a tangent too much. I've got to make sure I hit home at that thesis, which we talk about in the introductory label, proximity, competition, history. Um, I'm curious. I've been to one Cardinal Cub game. It was in St. Louis. I've been to two playoff games in my life, uh, both in St. Louis. And there's a different energy at the ballpark during a playoff game. Everybody's living and dying on every pitch. And what I was so surprised about, it was the same way at a Cardinal Cup game. Everybody was living and dying on each pitch. And to me, that made that so exciting. Do you guys feel a different energy when uh, the yeah. Cardinals, the Cubs, they come into town? Absolutely. When yeah. the red t-shirts invade, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> and, and you, know, you hear that? <laughs> what, what I know about this team rivalry is that when we have the Cubs in St. Louis, we are really a mixed crowd. We have almost as much blue representing the mm -hmm. Cubs as we do red with the Cardinals. And I've noticed it particularly, I was at the game mm -hmm. on Friday. Lydia would be really excited about that game. Um, <laughs> but what I was noticing was it seemed like there was even more blue there. Uh, and yeah. I think coming off of your world championship year, congratulations mm -hmm. on Thank that. You. It's <laughs> a, such an awesome thing, right? You'll um, never hear that again from a Cardinal, but <laughs> thank you. I just want you to know that once the Cardinals were out of it, I was rooting for the Cubs. Talk about yeah, a house divided. My husband's family is from Chicago. And he says, you know, I think for my, in honor of my dad, I'll, I'll root for the Cubs. And I was like, okay, great, I will too, you know. And he's just not a baseball guy, so I'd be in there watching the games. <laughs> and I'm, I'm rooting on your team. And uh, I was like, Mike, you know, and he's off listening to music in the other room or something. So, I don't know. <laughs> It's a house divided in different ways. Yeah. But, but the key thing is, is that there really is always a full house, a good crowd, mm -hmm. a lot of excitement. And I've been sitting right next to Cubs fans, and we have a great time together. Yep. Mm -hmm. We yeah. really do. Mm -hmm. and, and that's part of what makes it great, mm -hmm. is that, you know, we don't hate each other. No. It's, it's this wonderful. We just want your team to go down. <laughs> rivalry, and uh, you know, yeah. I got more World Series. Uh oh. <laughs> we have better. more wins against you. <laughs> you do. True. You do. True. There are so many ways that we can divide yeah. it up, but but the truth is. No, but it's one of the fun things baseball. about the rivalry is it's it's playful between the teams. And uh, we have always felt an incredible amount of support from the Red Sox, the Red Sox, oh God, from <laughs> the Cardinals front office. And, and Paul has always been available to us whenever we've had questions, and we've had a lot of questions. And I think what's really, you actually made this comment earlier tonight, and you were absolutely right, which is the rivalry doesn't exist but for the fans. Uh, there's a lot of baseball, and baseball is such a huge part of our culture that doesn't exist but for the fans. And, and I think any one of our players would tell you that it means more to them when they walk into Wrigley Field and they're playing the Cardinals. It means more to them because they know that every single person who's there really, really wants to see their team win, regardless of what color they're wearing that day. And, and it, it impacts how you play, and it means a lot more. And, and I think up until this past fall, 
every single player on our team would have told you that game four of the NLDS in 2015 was their absolute favorite game of all time, not just because they won, but because of who they wanted against, how hard it was played by both teams, uh, how hard fought it was, and, and what it meant to the fans. And we had quite a few Cardinals fans in our ballpark that day as well. And, and there, there's just something different about a rivalry. And I think a lot of it is, you know, yeah, storied franchises, team that you can respect, rival that you can respect. You always know it's going to be a hard fought battle. But it's also the person you're sitting next to in the ballpark, <coughs> maybe your neighbor, and uh, they probably didn't necessarily grow up there. There's a lot of back and forth between the two cities. And so, you know, you have people traveling, it's close by, but you also have the St. Louis fans who now live in Chicago, mm -hmm. the Cubs fans who now live in St. Louis. And so it's, it's fun to root against your neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> the question over here. So this is a little bit of a coming out party for us <laughs> because uh, one of the benefits of this exhibit uh, has been to uh, kind of establish uh, that the program needed a full-time uh, representative and full-time leadership. And so, Chris, you want to stand up? Chris Jarosik is our new assistant director of... I feel kind of silly being up here because she's the expert and I'm just the person who happened to be here over the last year. Uh, but uh, yes, we, we are uh, dedicating more resources. Uh, you know, I want to be absolutely frank, it's been very difficult to find the balance because, you know, when, when Theo's looking for pictures, we're going to give him the money that he needs. And, uh, and, and it's, it's been a balancing act as we've been trying to rebuild uh, our entire system and at the same time restore our ballpark and there has and you know doing that without any help from our city state or local government in terms of finances uh, they've been very supportive in other ways uh, you know it, it's it's been a it's been a, a tough road to hoe uh, but to the extent that everybody really enjoys this exhibit, I would ask you, you know, reach out, let us know, uh, you know, tell us. There's an email address on cubs.com. We read every single email. We want to hear from you. And if you'd like to see more of this at Wrigley Field, we, we already started some fledgling efforts in that regard. But if you'd like to see more, let us know. When I, I went to a ball game with, with Lydia, and one thing she mentioned, was which was a long one too. <laughs> yeah, was, that was great. I have no problem with the length of games. It was um, like a thirteen innings. <laughs> but uh, and there's no one I would have liked to spend that much time Back with. Back at you. Thank you very much. Um, but she made a great point, which uh, which the Cubs have have really uh, embraced, which is while they don't have a museum. Um, in the traditional sense, Wrigley Field itself is a living museum. They mm -hmm. you know, realized, you know, what are we doing? This is our museum. Yeah. And, um, and I couldn't agree more. It's, it's fantastic. And what they're doing with it is fantastic as well. Well, they're part making of it accessible. Out of need because we just don't have the space. Yeah. We don't have a brand new ballpark and we don't have a service level. One of the things I really enjoyed when you gave me your <laughs> tour was, you have a freight elevator. That's amazing. <laughs> you know, up until a year ago, we didn't have a freight elevator. You know, we, we don't have the, the, just the spatial resources that a lot of other teams have. And so we made the decision, uh, gosh, now four years ago when we started the restoration effort that everything in the ballpark needs to be either for the players or the fans. So my office got moved out of the ballpark. All of our offices were moved out and everything is being restructured. And so finding you know, 8,000 square feet just isn't gonna happen inside Wrigley Field. Uh, if anyone's been on the concourse in the middle of a game, it's just not gonna happen. Uh, so we've tried other approaches. We have some historical displays in the bleachers. Uh, we're putting some displays in our office building that will be open to the public. Uh, we're gonna try some outdoor displays and 
you know, any nook and cranny that we can find, <laughs> we're going to try to find a safe, secure, and, uh, you know, protective way to start telling some more stories. Awesome. Uh, thinking back about 1998, you can remember what happened. We had a rivalry between two people, essentially. Yeah. And they were two people that brought the rivalry stronger between the Cubs and the Cardinals, but also brought people back to baseball that had dropped out. And both uh, Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire, when they were interviewed, they both said, we do feel like we help bring baseball back. They both admitted that in, in the interview recently. So I thought that was kind of cool. And uh, I had the great honor of working in public relations with Jim Cooney and Marty Hendon. In 1979, a uh, uh, great summer. Got to be with Jack Buck, get some booth and everything else. So I have a great love for the Cardinals, but and I didn't. I can't really say I did root for the Cubs. I will say that. <laughs> you know, you, you, you know, when you mention the '98 home run chase, maybe that is the best connection between baseball and astrophysics. <laughs> you finally found wow. it. <laughs> awesome. Well, while you were talking, before you even said his name, I had this memory of Marty Hendon. Marty Hendon was our Vice President of Community Relations at the Cardinals for many, many, many years. And he was the guy that if some celebrity was visiting St. Louis, he somehow made a contact with him and brought him down to the ballpark and did a ceremonial first pitch. We have so many amazing pictures of Marty Hendon with all kinds of people. <laughs> But, you know, Marty, during 1998, with Sammy Sosa and Mark McGuire, and all of that going on, he said, it is like playing a World Series here every single day. Do you know what it's like up in the press box? Because there was so much attention. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, it was astounding how, how many people wanted to be in our normal size press box, and we were like, well, we don't have that much room. Mm -hmm. We were trying to find all kinds of places to put people while that home run chase was going on. I'm sure the same thing was happening up with you, mm -hmm. that it was, it was pretty amazing. And, and Marty Hendon's comparison to, you know, it was as big as playing World Series games mm -hmm. every day. Um, I think that really spoke a lot to how incredible it was. In the back. Yes. This, this is a question for Lydia. We see a ring sparkling. Did you see that ring? I did, actually. <laughs> no, There's Paula's one got here. one too. One over I here too. Yeah. Paula this, has more this rings than I do. This is just my National League championship <laughs> ring. It's not my World Series one. You can't wear all the World Series rings. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> not enough fingers. Down here, yeah. Young guy. Oh, the ring. He was inquiring about the ring. Oh, about the ring? <laughs> Hang out afterwards. Lydia will show it to you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's rather large. <laughs> uh, it's awesome. Tom didn't size it for women. Yes, sir. As a volunteer, I worked in the exhibit yesterday with two groups kind of kept in mind. One of them was a busload of school children from the south side of Chicago. Yeah. And they walk into the exhibit and say, Where's the flight size? Where's the flight size? <laughs> That's pretty awesome. It's money well spent. <laughs> yes, sir. Is there an artifact not in the exhibit, even one that's been lost to time, that you wish you could have brought into the exhibit that captured the vibe of it? Yes. 
There's a lot. I'll tell you one that is not lost to time, and I'll tell you where it is, um, that we were hoping to get. We didn't, weren't able to pull off. There's a number that we weren't able to pull off that, you know, you, you do the best you can. I mean, there's, there's close to 20 artifacts from the Cardinals. The Cubs have a uh, half dozen artifacts. The, the, my institution, the Hall of Fame, has uh, around 60 artifacts in the, in the exhibit. Um, Oh, I one, think I know what you're going to say. Yeah. So one of the <laughs> things that I did when I was uh, in Chicago doing sort of scouting for various other artifacts was I went to the Chicago History Museum, which is a great institution. And they have, so uh, the, how many people know about Gabby Hartnett's home? You, you already, you're already on top of this. Gabby Hartnett hit, <laughs> hit what was, um, you could argue is the greatest home run in, in, in mm -hmm. Cubs history. I, I would say that the Kyle Schwarber one is pretty dang close. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, and I'm, yeah, I'll no, let you I was going to say the homer and the Gloman. Yeah, yeah. And, but the, they have both the bat and ball mm -hmm. from this late September 1938 home run that Gabby Hartnett hit. Um, and we, we went together, and we, neither of us knew it was going to be there, mm -hmm. and we both looked at each other and were like, wow, this would be great. And mm -hmm. I, it, it unfortunately, it didn't happen, but it's a fantastic artifact. I wish it, I wish it had. Mm -hmm. That was a, a really great one. Yeah. One that I can think of. I don't know what. Yeah. We have a, a baseball signed by Gabby Hartnett that says, the greatest thrill of my career, and it has the date, home run. And uh, it's, it's just a, you know, that home run was the home run of Cubs history uh, yeah. until a few recently that probably compete. I also wanted to get the Kyle Schwarber home run that landed atop but that one didn't happen either. I'm trying, but. I'm trying, I'm <laughs> Hopefully trying. someday. It's still yeah. up there. <laughs> yeah, we know where that is, and you can't see it. But you can see the one at the Chicago History Museum. Uh, well, I want to tell you about the artifact that got away from me. Harry Carey's glasses. Mm. <laughs> where are they at? They're with the Hall of Fame. <laughs> yeah. We have a, and actually yeah. they would have, it, by, there's no question they would have been in this exhibit. Yeah. But we already had the earmarked for a traveling exhibit that we're doing, and, and that traveling exhibit has actually fewer artifacts from the hall of, from the baseball hall of fame mm -hmm. are in the traveling exhibit than are in this exhibit here. The traveling exhibit has uh, forty, I think it's forty five artifacts, um, and that's our traveling exhibit. This exhibit, the rivalry exhibit, has over sixty art, uh, sixty artifacts from the from the museum. But it was already earmarked to go somewhere else, so unfortunately, that's not. That wasn't available. It's just the, the story of how all this stuff falls into place. Tom, all these folks are extremely busy. Tom was working on a, uh, a traveling exhibit that went to all sorts of ballparks across the United States. We were able to find him at just that moment in his schedule to where he was help, able to help us out with this. The one casualty was, I didn't get Harry, Harry Gary's glasses. And it still pains me, but someday I am going to go to the Hall of Fame and I'm going to get to see Harry Gary's glasses. Yes. Have you been to the Hall of Fame? I have never been to the National Baseball Hall of Fame. <laughs> I want to go desperately, though. You have an in. I want to make another comment. Go ahead. I'm going to embarrass her, I know. My daughter's actually going to intern this summer at the Baseball Hall of Fame. Oh, nice. All right. That's great. Nice. Congratulations. This is, we have a wonderful internship program. It's about 20 to 22 students um, and uh, it's a, our steel internship program and that is really impressive because um, I think it's about we get uh, you know three four hundred people applying mm. um, that's a, that's very impressive in and of itself I will see you in a few weeks <laughs> good job yeah So how did we work together during this whole process? You know, uh, I don't know about anybody else, but we have a museum software program. It's basically a database of everything that we have cataloged in our collection. And so after we had some initial conversations over the phone, I started doing some different searches in my uh, catalog database to figure out, well, what things really are going to pop up here for us? and um, found uh, things that were associated with players that had maybe played on both teams or things that were, um, like we have some Maguire Sosa things, um, and just really started to develop kind of a, a list of things uh, that seemed to make sense for uh, this 
particular topic. And uh, you, Tom, and you, Sam, came uh, at some point when we were ready to kind of talk about what some of those things might be, um, give them a sense for what we had available. But this was still very early on in the process. And so you kind of snowball, avalanche this guy with like, hey, we got this, 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 you know. And, and his job is much more difficult to, you know, weave together this story and understand what thing he is going to select that helps him illustrate the content. Yeah, the, I, I'm a huge believer in, in our high tech world, I'm a huge believer in, in meeting people face to face as much as possible, which is tough because I'm up in Cooperstown, which is not easy to get to. Mm -hmm. um, Springfield is an hour and a half from St. Louis or three and a half hours from Chicago. Um, so, there, you know, we're all over the place. And that, I have to say, that's the hard, for me, that was easily the hardest part because I really wish that we could have been together more. But I visited um, here two or three times, um, went up to Chicago, did a scouting trip there, St. Louis. Um, so I did a lot of face-to-face. -face. I, I feel that that's the most important thing initially to, to do is um, to, to meet someone and to understand them. I work so much better by way of email or by phone or Skype or whatever if I've actually met with somebody. Something about it, it's still a human connection kind of a thing, so mm -hmm. that's, I, I feel strongly about that. But it wasn't easy because um, it's, uh, it's a lot, a big part of putting together an exhibit is about communication. And, um, and it's harder to do that communication from a distance. As, as much as you think of the modern world being so close, it's, it's, it's very tough. <coughs> I, that was the biggest challenge I, I felt. So the easy answer to that is uh, we utilized every form of communication yeah. you can imagine. Uh, we had some of those face-to-face -face meetings, but literally, I mean, we exchanged hundreds of emails. Um, you know, and then if we talk about the internal team, I see Carla Smith and Christian McWhorter, our, our design team of uh, Mike Casey. Uh, those were several more hundred emails. Are they so, here? Are they here? Me. I can't see. There's Carla. They Carla's stand, here. There Christian's there in the They back. should stand up. This yeah. team was fantastic. Carla These are and Michael two of them, but. and Christian. Our registrar, our research historian, absolutely fabulous. I couldn't, I gotta say, it, as tough as it was working at a distance, I couldn't have picked a, a better crew than everybody up here, and, and these guys were fantastic, they were fantastic. Yeah, it's constant communication through the whole thing, phone calls, emails, all that sort of thing, and then once we hit a certain stage in this collaboration, then it becomes a fabrication, getting this thing all together. And that's where the real communication uh, uh, takes place with meetings all the time and uh, uh, that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> so one more question. We'll wrap up. Yeah. Sam, this is for you. All right. You need to put it on your bucket list. Yeah. Don't miss Cooperstown. <laughs> OK. <laughs> That's right. That's, that's beautiful. I like that. I will get there, I swear, and I hope it's not uh, during my end days when I'm really trying to check off those bucket list items. I want to get there earlier than that. That's a good uh, note to end on. Um, we have a reception afterwards. Uh, it's going to be here in the plaza. Thank you to Bill and Julie Cellini. We'll be able to uh, uh, gather a little bit. You'll be able to talk to uh, all of us here. Our exhibit will be open. You can take a look if you've got questions. No better people to ask uh, than these folks here, as well as uh, the folks who helped us uh, create this exhibit. Tonight was about hearing some of those stories. Tonight is also about saying thank you. And so on behalf of the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum, I want to say thank you to Paula, Tom, and Lydia, Chicago Cubs, St. Louis Cardinals, National Baseball Hall of Fame. My God, thank you guys. I also want to thank uh, our great team here at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum. We have an awesome team here. Uh, it starts with our executive director, Alan Lowe, who's here tonight. Uh, 
Chief of Staff Nadine O'Leary was absolutely instrumental in all this, our wonderful foundation, as well as too many people uh, uh, to thank, but Carla, Christian, you're here, Mike Casey, uh, Kim Neerit, you guys, uh, Jeff Nevins, our light man, uh, Chris Wills with all the, the great press releases, my goodness, we can't do what we do without uh, our team here. And then finally, thank you, because uh, if it wasn't for you, uh, we wouldn't have done this exhibit because we had a hunch that uh, you'd be interested in this story. So thank you all very much, and we'll see you outside. <laughs>